in that awakened heart that is not busy with being loved, but becoming love, becoming the love that I am, not finding the love that I never had. It's becoming the love that I never had, not finding it. And then you find it by resonance. You find it because you've become it. Do you see? So finding it starts with becoming it. You can't find it by looking for it. Hello, hello. It's Christine Marie Mason, your host for the Rose Woman podcast, where every week we invite a conversation on more love, more liberation, more freedom in the body, more joy. And that is a very perfect topic for my guest today, Patrick Connor. I will tell you, the night that I met Patrick was quite unexpected for me. I was supporting my beloved friend, Adam Bauer, who has also been on the show. He's an amazing devotional singer in the Kirtan tradition, sort of that stuff you hear in the background in yoga class sometimes. And Adam and I were singing in Los Angeles, and it was a really beautiful night. It was the end of Adam's tour, and everybody was quite high on the music and on the fellowship and on spirit. And after that, a man came up to me and said hello and said some complimentary things. And I was immediately drawn to him. Like I felt joyful in my body. I felt happy. I felt so expanded. And I just kept wanting to talk to him. There were like little wisdom bombs that were coming out even in the few minutes that we were conversing. But there were a lot of people who'd come to LA to see us. So I kept going, hold on, I've got to talk to people and say hi to this person who's come all the way for this show. Hold on, don't go anywhere. And I kept going back and forth. And, you know, finally, I said, so what's your name? And he said, Oh, my name's Patrick. I said, Patrick, what? And he said, Oh, you wouldn't know I fly under the radar. And then I said, Wait a minute, are you my friend Amy's Patrick? And he goes, Well, actually, yes, I am maybe not so under the radar. And it turns out that, you know, this friend of mine, Amy had been telling me for over a year that I should meet Patrick, that he had something for me. And so we arranged to meet and it was an instant nerd out on Indian philosophy and Vedant and Tantra and all of that stuff like we could scholar out. But it was also a very clear and non, you know, no intellectual knowledge needed, like all this stuff was fun, but it was a distraction from the core transmission of unconditional love. I had the experience with him that he could see me and notice everything that was really up and going on in me, but love me unconditionally. And plus it was super joyful. We were laughing a lot and, and um, that's how I came to know him. So since then I've learned that, you know, he's got a very strong and beautiful community of people who are interested in how they can live in more joy and less suffering, which, as you know, has been the tagline of Rosebud since the day I started it seven years ago, more joy and less suffering, how they can live in the frequency of wonder, how you can let go of the stories of struggle and really move in a different way in the world. And that's an amazing invitation because out of that place, so much more can be created we will definitely not be creating the kind of world of war and conflict that we have. So it is with great pleasure, great, great pleasure, I introduce you to my friend, a person I consider a personal guide, Patrick Connor. We begin with the conversation around the difference between wisdom and knowledge, no matter what spiritual path you're on. Yeah, well, so first is just to notice that uh, the mind likes to be busy, especially trained in our culture. Our whole education system is train is a training of acquiring information and considering that to be knowledge and not being able to really make the distinction between knowledge versus wisdom or, or even mastery, which has a great deal to do with the illumination of the intuition, not merely the acquisition of more information. You know, there's a one of my favorite sayings in Lao Tzu's great treatise, The Tao Te Ching, is in the pursuit of knowledge, every day something is added. In the practice of the Tao, every day something is dropped. And so it takes a few things. First of all, just to notice that the whole education system is a kind of training in mental window shopping, <laughs> you know, and uh, which is, you know, okay. And uh, I'm not suggesting that curiosity isn't, isn't, you know, wonderful. And, uh, and that the you know, tools of, that are currently available to the faculty of curiosity are 
glorious. That said, there's a kind of universal principle of ma maturing, um, and maturing not as something spiritual, but maturing in in mastery of of how this game of life works. And and mastery means more love and more joy, <laughs> you know, and more inspiration. Not like more discipline. Mm. It's like it's more more freedom, more delight, you know, and more inspiration. It's it's to really learn how to open oneself deeply to the influence of the great spirit by whatever name one calls that in this intelligence within that is the source and to open oneself to the influence of revelation and presence and grace and divine assistance people either conflate with religion in which case it's usually a giant turnoff or think of as being out there and so esoteric as to be kind of nebulous and just a belief system rather than something palpable that you can actually touch if you if you choose it and open to it and you know i like to make the distinction between belief which is flimsy you know people have been killing each other for their beliefs at least fighting vigorously uh, with each other about their beliefs whether they're philosophers or religious people or other ideologues for centuries whereas so beliefs are flimsy but uh, the invitation of of all true pathways of wisdom is a uh, is to walk into the realm of direct knowing where where you go past belief the word that keeps coming to me is apprentice oh. and how when you go like deep into apprenticeship uh, it's not a mind knowing it's a practical touch it feel it experience it I, I was even thinking of some of the great artists like i was very surprised to go to the museums in barcelona and see picasso's early work where at 16 or 17 he was making photographic quality oil painting reproductions of court scenes so out of that mastery and discipline he could then be free and move into abstraction and expression and joy and liberation there's a certain quality of the discipline that we speak of as overriding the body that kind of mastery that is done in service of the freedom to explore. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to mm -hmm. take the, the negative imposition hair shirt aspect mm -hmm. of discipline and turn it into discipleship. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're pointing to the, the kind of, yeah, the hair shirt version, which, is, which emphasizes a hardship and difficulty and, uh, and maybe even kind of self-abnegation. You know, the, the whole idea in all the ancient wisdom cultures of controlling the lower nature uh, which which paradoxically is done best without the atmosphere of control <laughs> <laughs> you know but actually through love and invitation and embrace yeah when we were speaking initially about this particularly over the body so one of the things i loved when we first began speaking was this inclusion of the body and kundalini descending or the descending light or the gate that moves downward into the body instead of just being like ascension theology that you include and you love your body and then in the loving and knowing of it you can kind of find a uh, what's true and good for it and then you wouldn't act out and do things that are unhealthy or unwise with your body you wouldn't need an external voice to tell you what to do you would know because you were intimate with yourself yeah and listening to your feelings in the body <laughs> which is guidance rather than something to get on top of. Mm, yeah. So could you say more about your teaching on that, about how that works? Well, um, I mean, speaking from my experience that uh, having mastered the process of, of somewhat mastered the process of not listening to my body <laughs> for mm. a long time, mm -hmm. um, I've just, and just <laughs> really in a spiritually intentional swashbuckling kind of way, and at some point I began to really see that when you really embrace the feeling level of the body, the the embracing process is its own kind of healing field where there may be what the classical spiritual teachings simply just call desire, the desire that needs to kind of be got rid of. But if you throw the whole paradigm of getting rid of anything away and you really, really learn to embrace the feeling field, and the body, it kind of sorts itself out. That which, when you become intimate enough with your own feeling field, you begin to become sensitive to, to the energy of guidance uh, versus the energy of compulsiveness. 
And I began to see, you know, it's, it's a different way to navigate life than the mind's idea of navigating via problem solving. You know, like I began to see that, for example, for example, let's imagine I'm having some difficulty with something and the mind is caught, let's say, in the vibration of lack or fear, or scarcity or worry. And if I try to apply the mental faculty in the vibration of lack or fear or scarcity or worry, that's the seed I'm planting. Um, that's, the, that's what's sponsoring the inquiry, that vibration. Uh, whereas if I move, if I find a way to move up to joy, which might mean moving into joy in some domain that has nothing to do with the problem I'm trying to solve, but some way to ride the elevator upwards into a, a different vibrational field, which might mean taking my attention completely off what I'm, you know, anxiously trying to solve. I find that in the frequency of joy, there's spaciousness, there's kind of insight, there's revelation. And now I'm in a vibrational field in which Either the problem goes away or uh, I'm kind of magnetic to, to solutions. Things come, people come, opportunities come, possibilities are, emerge. There's yeah. a teaching on creativity or research on creativity and innovation, the seeing of new solutions that you're speaking of, where people mostly have their insights while they're in the shower <laughs> or in the park or dancing, or doing something completely unrelated to the stuff that they were struggling with in the lab. Right, and right. so I, I, when, you, when you're saying, like, move into the frequency of joy, and then out of that, see what arises, what's magnetized into your consciousness, is it, a, is it as simple as that, as like putting down your problem and going out and dancing? It is and it isn't. In one sense, it is as simple as that. And, and that is such a big doorway to such a giant journey. I mean, what I noticed for myself is how deeply habituated my whole field had been to navigating from worry, problem solving, and doing. Uh, as though, uh, like I, I had it so wired up that worrying is somehow being responsible about things and, <laughs> you know, worry, obligation, duty, doing. And, uh, and I just had nothing in like my family environment, but also the cultural field at large that invites the possibility that life could be flow, that life could just be ease. And the, 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 not, not, e not an ease of, of the way our culture thinks of ease, which is material comfort. It's not that kind of ease. It's, a, it's an ease of releasing the conditioning of struggle and fixation with difficulty and all of the expectation of not being supported, not being met, not being seen, which points to the original bargain you were beginning to talk about. So this, it's, it's a deep, deep process. Yeah, I mean, I found that to be one of the m most compelling moments in our dialogues. Uh, one, when we were speaking about aligning to the frequency of the family of origin, and then consciously deciding to change your alignment to beings who had crossed over the Great River. You know, to people who had, who had lived in a body and who had moved into what we would commonly call enlightenment or a unification consciousness, but while in the body. And I found that when I'm moving back into a habituated state of like what my family would do or, or, or something like that, that I can then close my eyes and sense into the vibrational frequency of one of those beings and then the entire feeling changes there was even a vision associated with it you were in it actually where you with your golden heart like appeared in the room and and then this like beautiful golden light coming from your heart and in that elevation field that you hold I was also lifted up into that my heart became wide open and golden and and then in that frequency I could see all kinds of people all around the world that I had met at various points. A woman I met once one day in Texas and my friend Christopher Robbins on the East Coast, also with beautiful, bright, shining golden hearts and sort of a filament connected web across the planet. It's a beautiful vision and how aligning to that frequency also makes everyone in that frequency who's already there appear before you, you know, that you see the world that way. Anyway, it was, it was gorgeous and I saw something new, Patrick, in that moment about what, what you really are talking about when you say 
come into the frequency of one who has crossed over. Um, anyway, so so maybe we should back up a little bit and and talk about that original bargain, and then that could naturally lead us into this discussion of what it would mean to, in love, disalign yourself with those original deals. Wow, it's beautiful to to hear you and the the inspired way that you are holding that to uh, that shift. You know, to to really embody the the most sacred meaning of the the guidance of all the great ones, which is to take care of the company we keep. <laughs> you know, in our in our heart, you know, and uh, would it would it be would it be worth saying something about the original bargain that you're pointing to? Yes, yes. So what 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 I found is that so the child comes into into this life into the body and begins to look to the early caregivers to signal to to us who we should be, what we should be. Um, and we begin to line up with what's expected of us. And and the most challenging thing uh, that goes on is that we we start to look back at ourselves literally through the lens of the other. So we literally start to see ourselves from the other uh, and to lose touch with our own uh, essence and with our own depths. And so we, the bandwidth of soul essence, the bandwidth of the unique essence of our soul being and qualities is generally not received by those we are with and so we kind of narrow ourselves to perceiving ourselves through the lens of what they can see in us and in a way literally editing out what they can't see what they're jealous of what they don't recognize what they're not able to see by what they're unwilling to see and this is some of the deep sources of what often shows up as feelings of not being good enough and not, not being worthy and, and all of that, and self-rejection. So we, it's a kind of abandonment dynamic because it's all about lining up with the source of support in order to receive whatever love, support, and holding is available because the human infant is more dependent on its early caregivers than maybe any other species. That's a tremendously deep, intense process. And so... Um, the acculturation to tribe, we may we may call it, is quite profound. And many beings who already come with wisdom, I mean, it happens for everyone, and many beings who come with a lot of wisdom uh, often choose, and that this, there's more to say about that, but they choose uh, a family of origin, as we all do, but they choose a family of origin where there's tremendous difficulty and str struggle and challenge and a lot to work out, and generally a lot of motivation is generated for for the path of evolution and usually only somewhere later in life does one find one's way back to oneself and uh, through that process of intense learning and so and maybe the last thing to say is that that there's a that there's all kinds of programming of course associated with what's expected of us what is uh, how we're seen the experience of not being seen the experience of not really being met not really being received but the deepest, deepest, deepest layer of that is is just the feeling of life kind of saying no to us. You know, like we're as a child, we're in our exuberance and our playfulness and we're being too loud and someone goes, no, be quiet, Shh, shut up, <laughs> settle down, like re relax. And, and so we're taught that our joy and our exuberance is, uh, is kind of not, not right, that we've got to tone it down and and certainly past a certain age, we've got to kind of rein it in and make it fit into some social structure. What's that age? What's that age? Like 58? <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. Like, like I have to tell you. Yeah, last month or so. Last month or so. Like in group dynamics, I, I still feel that, oh, God, I got to tone myself down. Jesus. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so many of the most like creative, inspired, incredible humans I know have have had early life environments where in some way they've been given the message they're too much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, un undoing that is like super important. But unwinding it, so this is what you're, what you're pointing to the, about the descent, what I call the descending light. There's a undoing the beliefs and scripts, which is super important. But then there's undoing the literal feeling field, which expects life to be saying no to me. And like, that's so the water the fish are swimming in. 
It's undoing that. It's a feeling field that is so familiar that one has no clue it's there until it's pointed out. Is this what you would speak of as vibration or frequency also? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. This is the layer. This is the, the terrain that, uh, in a way, the retreat work is most deeply focused on, which is to deal with the deepest level of the conditioning of limitation that is multi-lifetime, pre-verbal and unconscious, which you just can't get to by questioning stories and looking at scripts. It's below the radar and, and it, you can only get to it by, by, by the light of, by the supreme reality, really, by the light of grace. Yeah, the, there's a piece in the way you speak about it that's very practical. And I wonder if we could kind of go there where, so you have this feeling come up and then you locate it in your body. And then you begin to look at it and you might see judgment arise, but you don't stop at judgment. You go through it all the way to non-judgment. And then you invite the light to look with you and you ask for help. That's sort of the encapsulation of what I remember from our dialogues before. And that this practice of asking for help, of like letting yourself be fully seen, not judged, loved, and then asking for help in releasing that was, it's not actually that difficult once you agree once you just voluntarily agree to be seen. Really, ah! <laughs> really, really. That's right. That's right. And, you know, just to, it's, it's amazing what you're saying. To agree to be seen, it's very poignant because the assumption from that context of the early life and what I call the original bargain is if you've not been seen uh, and really, really met and emotionally seen and held, then whatever projection you have about the supreme reality or the source or God or the divine intelligence is going to be seen through that same lens, that same filter. So you're going to ex unconsciously expect this intelligence not to see you in that same way. So so then there's a kind of, what's the point of asking that for help <laughs> when when you expect it not to see you? Also, when you, when you expect it not to see you, you also don't know that you are already always being seen mm -hmm. by by the you know you're naked anyway and that's like very disconcerting until until it's very very relieving <laughs> yeah this is the nappy story yeah this is the nappy it's the nappy story patrick yeah. told a story once super he's tell, he told a story once about being in a friend's house playing hide and seek with some littles and one had their uh little tushy nappy diapered tushy sticking out from under the sofa but her head was under the sofa so, two, two years yeah, old so she, so she thought she was hidden but <laughs> she's giggling under there but of course you know we everybody could see her um and that's how it is with the light you think you're hiding but they can see your dirty nappy right. <laughs> <laughs> i love that right, story right, right. well so 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 in this part i mean there's a piece where we've been even in the way the prayers have been translated from the Aramaic in the Christian tradition, where it's Father God or sometimes Mother Father God, where we've paternalized or parented uh, the image of the light. And so, of course, we're going to extrapolate that they have the same kind of judgmental characteristics or make wrong characteristics as our, as our family. So how do you remove that layer of parentalization of divinity? Mm -hmm. Oh, how beautiful. What a, what a deep question. So I would say the first is to see what I call the atmosphere in which you're looking at reality. I've had the privilege of working closely with many, many you know, yogis, yoginis, and beings who have really been at this inner work for, you know, decades and explored many traditions and practiced many kinds of meditation. And they've become very adept often at practices and methods and techniques and approaches and, and the discipline of those, but often have not looked at the atmosphere in which they're engaging those practices and processes, which is that they're looking at the divine through that lens and so beginning to look at the the way that they were met in their early life and some of the vibrational energetic emotional expectational fields they set up relationally about how they're expected to be and how what they're expecting relationally how they're expecting to be met so for example if uh, if they were rewarded for great struggle then their path that they will use all their practices to generate an atmosphere of great struggle, expecting, you know, realization or reward at the end of that. So it's it's amazing to really begin to see how how simple the mapping is from how we feel emotionally. If I was the the youngest child and I was 
and, and my parent really never had time for me. And something in me is likely to assume that maybe God doesn't have time for me and I'm, I'm bound to just be left out. And so I'm looking to be sort of saved and rescued rather like than given the, the sense that I can, I can come directly into that light and, and know that light directly. Um, so, so the first thing is to, to begin to see the filters clearly, because if you're looking at the filters, you're not looking from them anymore. So you bring into consciousness what is unconscious. Correct. That's a huge part of it, you know. And another part is really um, opening, and this is what you know, in a way, separates the casually curious from the committed who become adepts and the guides of of the race and of humanity and of our fellow beings, is one understands that a, a process of very powerful transformation is necessarily a process of opening to vistas of consciousness that you don't even know you're looking for. You don't even know what those dynamics are. You don't even know how the awakened intelligence that's beyond what you currently can see, you don't know how it sees. And so there has to be some process by which you reach deeply beyond the world of your mind, beyond your your feeling worldview. That's the true purpose of prayer or intention or surrender or, you know, and, and that's what invokes divine assistance and with it initiation. And every true path that is in any way catalytic and rapid involves some process of what I call initiation which is the invitation to the divine consciousness um, by, by alignment, by proper alignment, by opening oneself in an atmosphere of wonder and, and, uh, and readiness and uh, humility and passionate inspiration and willingness to see things clearly. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm in this, this visual that I'm getting is as if you're on a great sea and you're in a boat on a great sea and you reach over and you dip into the sea and you pull up a bucket and you rain it down on yourself. It's like when you speak about reaching into the field or into another level of perception, it's like a, oh, it's like so spacious and refreshing. Yeah, no, beautiful. I mean, another, so reaching into another level of perception, it, there's something in the soul that is consciously calling to see what I don't see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, which is a very different process than complaining about what I'm seeing. <laughs> you know, let me know. see let me it's see like, what i don't see let me see what i don't well, see well you know <laughs> if you can sing like that then you then you then you have you know like millions of extra points so. i feel it like a i feel it like a a song i do that that this this yearning you know to have the lens or the blinders removed like you know it's there please please wipe these lenses clean is a as a true longing. Yeah. Maybe if I went at it from with, without the without the energy of longing, it might be different. Say more. Well, you know, sometimes okay. So I left the main churches and singing in all those traditions because it was all this petition, and I'm a I'm a lowly sinner, and, you know, kind of like patriarchy, all that stuff. But I I started singing in the in the Eastern traditions before I knew what the words meant or before I knew what the the Sanskrit before I had any cognitive energy around the words and so it was always singing from like just this like joy and adoration and reverence and no story and I was wondering like sometimes with these ways that we're taught to pray there's a a vibration of lowliness and petition that is different than communion and I'm I, I maybe 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 what do you think does it limit the impact of the way we interact with the unity you know so that's that, that's so interesting so i would say ultimately yes and weirdly um in in many ways no um in other words like what i've learned to do is to be very is to be perceptive sensitive to vibration and to understand that in any call in any moment uh, in any attitudinal moment let's say uh in any part of our system we may have several different vibrations mixed into the same chalice so for example one part might be the the veil of lowliness which uh, you're pointing to pr very precisely you know and another might be the genuine longing to see things clearly 
you know, but we're just looking, we're just asking from a, the habit of an identity, the identity of lowliness. But so the lowliness isn't required, but the call to see things clearly generates a response from the field because it's a, it's, it's, it's a true call that pulls on the field actually from within the field. So we may then interpret that it was the lowliness that was giving us the, the, the credentials for, for that call to be answered, but that isn't, that isn't so. It really isn't so. And so refining the atmosphere is all about what you're pointing to. You know, so you could, for example, replace lowliness with wonder, mm -hmm. yeah, which doesn't have any hierarchy frame in it. And the passionate inspiration to want to see things clearly. And with it, piousness and these kinds of energies that are sort of in some way soaked in guilt and judgment and, and hierarchy and tribal kind of uh, layers of who's eligible for what, <laughs> you know. In the, re in, in the realm of the infinite, one must be ready to ask for the whole nine yards. All right. I'm, I'm into it. I want, can, can you say more about the hierarchy of piousness? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you do it just, just to set it up slightly. You, you know, one thing you're, you said, not only are you suffering or not being able to request support or access support from joy, but on top of it, you're trying to pretend that you're already spiritually there. And you add the layer of pretending as another layer of suffering, something like that. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, try, one, one, try one, things one, that trying to be spiritual. I mean, one of the, one of the th one of the things that uh, I've seen very much in, if one engages very sincerely, a process of recognition of the non-duality of existence, and overlooks the reality that there's parts of one system that aren't there yet. Then, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people I've met who are proud to have let go of the seeker. And now they're trying to kind of evolve themselves and heal themselves without really allowing there to be a recognition that there's much to heal, you know. So that's kind of tricky, which is which is kind of a little what you're what you're pointing to. And I'm speaking for myself actually, you know, just uh, one of the things that can happen on the road of of wisdom attainment is for a time one trades in a kind of worldly identity of being someone, you know, interesting or special or funny or important or something that has given one some credentializing process and trades it in for a spiritual identity that is uh, hoped to be more credentializing. And, you know, it's a block, it's a fail, it's a wall. Um, so at some point, one comes to a real owning of the freedom, really, of being eternally a work in progress. And 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 beginning to s smell like the mist of the perfume of of grace in which the intelligence of life is actually endless and love is actually endless and grace is actually endless and magic is actually endless and inspiration is actually endless and so the whole fixation with an end point sort of mercifully kind of evaporates and unbelievably freeing. <laughs> Um, my teacher on the trauma side, uh, Thomas Hubel, speaks of that as walking forever. We are walking forever. There's a beautiful phrase that you've used uh, on allowing yourself to be receptive to guidance also, which seems in line with some of this getting through the stage of spiritual identity where you've got it all figured out. It's an incredible thing, receptivity to guidance, because, you know, you could just say, oh, yeah, humility is like, you know, 101. And it's deeper than that. It's uh, Or another way to say it is the application of that, the embodiment of that, is a really, really amazing and profound thing. Because the whole culture invites us to think of ourselves as acquiring knowledge. And many of the uh, humans who actually have the most capacity to be, be very, very, very profound teachers and and inspirers and sources of instruments of wisdom and grace on the earth are also often when they come to a, a point of being ready to to really go way further um, they're often already in a position of being you know teachers and guides and inspirers to others and like that the, the, they are that i mean that's you know of course that's true of you and 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 others that uh, 
And, and so when one is already being called into life by just the wisdom one has attained and how far one has walked and the life experience one has crossed, that uh, the invitation from the community of the world is often to to see ourselves as a teacher that has it all figured out or a teacher that should have it all figured out. And rather than to to stay at the edge of our own expansion and to know that there isn't a limit to grace and there isn't a limit to love. And, you know, there's a beautiful saying, there's a beautiful recognition that says that the archangels are just beginning to sense the glory of the Creator. <laughs> and uh, so wonder is just uh, is a very profound kind of mudra. It's a very to keep oneself in wonder and and then paradoxically to be to become empty or transparent to the influence of of the universal presence and then to, to allow oneself to be spoken by that and lived by that and not to imagine that that what's coming through is is some kind of static knowledge that can be owned by a person in a, in a location you know, like for it to truly be divine medicine, it's fresh. I mean, it's living, it's fresh and it's living. I would love to ask you a couple of life stage questions because I have a lot of uh, people in the community who are parents. And one of the questions that I get is, how do we avoid doing the same things to our offspring as were done to us? How do I raise up someone in this non-judgment and provide guidance but not make wrong I could you could you speak to that a little you know I, I'd, I'd love for you to just invite more elaboration in any directions you see uh, helpful but uh, one thing I I notice is that there are three initially there are three primary axes which are the you could say dimensions along which as parents we can most serve our children one of them is is the presence and development of unconditional love, which is really to do with the awakening of the frequency field of love within us. And as that develops and we become wiser and wiser, that love becomes more and more, you know, unconditional. The second is is modeling. Literally we, we give to our children what we have become and what we have embodied within ourselves vibrationally. And so very often Parents are busy worrying about their children. They, they haven't been shown that meeting the challenges that the children are facing within themselves, those kinds of challenges, modeling curiosity, modeling the desire to, to grow, modeling the inspiration for change, modeling the sense that the world is safe. I mean, these are simple things, but they're unbelievably deep to literally to model just this simple idea to model the frequency field that the world is beautiful that everything is possible learning is joyful expansion is fascinating and that uh, everything can be healed i mean like it's literally modeling the the everything is possible consciousness and the third is mirroring is mirroring to our children their light their goodness, their gifts, their uniqueness. And and mirroring as we evolve and become more adept. One of the hallmarks of, of deep evolution is what I call the illumination of the intuition or the awakening and purification or illumination of the third eye, the center of seeing, um, the sixth chakra sometimes known. And so what, what, what becomes possible as we evolve is to mirror others in in their unique gifts which is more than just encouragement it's more than just you know motivation it's more than just generically believing in them or or saying to my child oh, i love you you know i love you and i i'm with you and i believe in you it's it's like why wow, you have this credible quality you know you have this quality of uh guilelessness that is very special and beautiful and you have do you see to this mirroring that is very precise and and by by its precision and integrity has a kind of divine authority to it that is then unbelievably powerful and of course it it has to stand in the in the integrity of 
of, of never ever saying to your child something in those terms that, that you don't actually see and know to be true, so that the quality of your integrity and impeccability then lends to it an authority in which they receive it, literally as though they're receiving it from the source, which actually it would be in that case. And, and it's transformative, very transformative. Thank you. Uh, when you're speaking about mirroring, you have to be highly attentive and also your lens might be helped if it was clear of where the things that are showing up in them showed up in you and you were judged. You know, like I, I think if I have a friend who's was a award-winning pianist and, and she wanted so badly for her daughter to be that. And when the daughter wouldn't comply, all of her own shame at not being better was transferred onto the daughter instead of seeing the daughter and her exact gifts. So I think there's something in this modeling piece that in the modeling is also the modeling of the willingness to keep stripping your own lens so you can be precise in your reflection to others. Yeah, beautiful. And what you're pointing to is, is in a way, part of the, the feedback loop in which uh, I call it the, the world becoming the theater of your own illumination and the field of parenting, especially being one such crucible, one such theater of illumination. So looking at the challenges, difficulties, fears, obstacles, consciousness limitations in your child and saying, is that going on here? Is there any of that showing up here? Do I have any of that kind of experience? And healing it here, mm. as per the you know the example of the the father who gives up smoking in order to give his his sixteen year old son the guidance that he might uh, a week later you know find it helpful to give up smoking, and it has the authority of him having you know done it himself. Um, so and and actually because we have such deep connections to our children. The children provide tremendous motivation, if one is up for seeing it that way, to heal what there is to heal in us. So to look in the mirror of our children for the, the GPS of our own healing is also a, a profound thing. And then another question that I get, about 70% of the people who listen to the show are women in their 40s and 50s and above, midlife people. I think many are opening up to new possibilities for freedom in the period after raising a family and finding who they are now. And there's still a lot of hanging on and struggle with the reality of female embodiment, beauty, youth, being appreciated for that, the feeling of turning invisible. And I feel there's a spiritual answer to this and that you you have some beautiful insights into that process of aging with radiance that I'd love to hear. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, one of the limitations of the cultural field we live in is to to imagine, to, to reflect back to women that they're in a way to the invitation to value themselves in terms of 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 their looks and their appeal to men in that way. And and the culture generically to men and women doesn't really teach one to know oneself and to know one's essence and to see who I really am from within me. And so when the body and the, the looks of, of the body are experienced to be, in a way, to be a kind of source of power, you know, for, for women in their, uh, when, they're, when they're younger, they don't think about that. But it's a burning candle. And to come to terms with aging requires understanding that one's impact on the world is not to do with how things appear uh, and how the body appears. It's it's to do with what you identify with. And so it doesn't actually matter. And it, one doesn't have to wait till one is, you know, 70 or 80 uh, to begin this journey. Um, that said, one can begin it at any time. And if the inspiration's there, then it can unfold very, very quickly. When a woman begins to identify and become inspired to kind of heal herself and to let go of some of the memes of the collective feminine, which are often to do with uh, attachment to certain kinds of identity uh, as ways to ultimately not be alone, which are some of the deep themes in the collective culture of the feminine. When women begin to see that there's a kind of empowerment 
which actually makes them more feminine, not less, which is the power and the, the willingness to see oneself clearly, the willingness to meet fear. One begins to see, you know, the feminine has just as much access as the masculine does to the source of consciousness, obviously, and to the light, obviously. And in some ways, women are more naturally attuned to the mystical, which is um, associated with the yin aspect of consciousness, the yin and the yang being the two primordial energies. And the yin aspect, which is the, the feminine, is, is generally stronger in women, and so they have more access to the, to the mystical and to the, the subtle realm of feeling than men do, who are often, especially men who have not evolved, be, begun the, the journey of evolution uh, very deeply, are often kind of lost in their, in their mental process. So, so women have an incredible head start in that way. If they're willing to, to take on the, the invitation to awaken their own inner strength, to meet their own feeling field, and to call for guidance and to identify with the light and receive initiation and become inspired for that, there's a kind of fortitude that develops that, that means that instead of women making their feelings the responsibility of others or the responsibility of men or the responsibility of society or of each other. They begin to become inspired to be creators and to be able to transform their own vibrations themselves from within. That that doesn't lead to being alone. That leads to a kind of mastery over the feeling field where you don't become less emotionally uh, broad or deep. You, you just become less controlled by the emotional field and and more able to meet your own fear and then as you become less fearful and in a way less needy a, a woman becomes more able to just rest in the grace of her divine feminine energy and light and the feminine energy is so important to life i mean there wouldn't be any men without it <laughs> obviously and uh, there wouldn't be any great yogis or yoginis or masters and the, the, the world is calling for the for the awakening of the divine feminine um, which is you know the, the feminine in her heart and it isn't only gentleness it's the gentleness backed by the strength of being willing to become a creator within herself and to unwind the prejudices and judgments and conditioning that we've grown up in to drop the whole idea that her value is her looks and to see herself as as a commodity in that way. You experience what you identify with if you experience yourself as being seen as a commodity. That belief is in you. It's, it, it's not out there. When a woman really, really develops her soul light and calls to be an instrument of the great divine feminine, she becomes this radiant, radiant blessing field walking in the world. And she begins to see that she's got the best job in the world. She can go around the world just blessing. You know, it's like it's the top job in the world, aside, you know, from being a mother. You know, just just to go around the world doing nothing other than holding the field for unconditional love, the recognition of others, mirroring them back in their light, and and being this fertile blessing field. And it doesn't matter how old the body is or what it looks like that woman will be surrounded by beings who are blossoming in her presence. You hear that, my friends? If you see yourself as a commodity, if you're self-objectifying, here's an invitation to become a walking blessing field. I love this shift in who are you? Who are you? You're not all that stuff. They tell you you are. Psst. Yeah, and, and in that awakened heart that is not busy with being loved, but becoming love, becoming the love that I am, not finding the love that I never had. It's becoming the love that I never had, not finding it. And then you find it by resonance. You find it because you've become it. Do you see? So finding it starts with becoming it. You can't find it by looking for it. Y'all y'all can't see. This is a podcast, so y'all can't see me. But I have my hands raised up, going whoop, whoop, <laughs> yes, aho, amen, inshallah, you know. Inshallah. 
you know, yeah, become the love you never had. Come on, babies. That's a really, I'm going to get a t-shirt that says that. The, the world needs the awakened feminine. It so deeply does. Because love's the ultimate, it's the final answer to everything. It's the final answer. The access to love is not gender specific, and the full fullness of that embodiment is available to the masculine and the feminine. But the feminine has a giant head start in it culturally, and uh, if she develops the strength to to be willing to become this love and to shine that radiance into the world, she, she becomes wildly creative and free. And if she wants to be partnered, there will be. No shortage of mates <laughs> in that blessing field. And no shortage of mates that will be resonant as she becomes the blessing field. Then she will find, if that's what she wants, a partner who can meet her there and is willing to be uh, in a process of transformation and to be the creator and to, and to be free of some of the more limited gender roles himself. I love this so much, Patrick. It's so beautiful. I would like to ask you about uh, your process of bringing your teachings out a little bit and speak about community and sangha. Once you said something to me very profound around belonging is the same as exclusion, and this echoes some larger polarity teachings, you know, like in-group is the same as out-group, etc. I was very struck by that knowing also that the people you surround yourself with can make it easier to to be in this inquiry and to be living in this field. But then there are also some strange dynamics that arise. And, and I, I wonder if you'd speak to what's happening for you as community starts to form around you. And, you know, how are you doing? How are you doing? What do you what do you see there? Yeah, thank you. So gosh, there's many things to say. It's such a such a deep field. And we're asking it from such a poignant place. I'd say that uh, there's a few things I notice. Well, in one sense, I've had community around me for more than 20 years. And so I'm aware of a few invitations I've made for all of that time, which is for there to be a completely open welcome door all the time. Uh, and in a way, that's the more obvious piece. And for the, the door to those, the exit door to also be open. In other words, to to have a community field that doesn't think of itself like a, like a company, like a business trying to retain customers. That, that that's not what love and truth are about. It's, it has to be different than that. I have no, we have no interest in customer retention, uh, like zero. It's a field of love and invitation. <laughs> Shh. <that's, laughs> yeah, there you go. So that's, that's like sacrilegious to most of entrepreneurial spiritualist so, yeah. voila, voila. but no and i have no interest in customer retention nor in proselytizing no go ahead but so, so all, all of the energy is in how can you make the most integrous loving offer and support a person in their consciousness expansion most joyfully and most inspirationally and that's a different question than how do you keep them and grow the numbers so that's been my single focus really for all of these years and it's, it's been basically entirely word of mouth during all that time. And that word of mouth at some point, it grows in a way that, uh, that it becomes helpful to have certain forms of media to, to make that invitation to others. But it's still an invitation of, of love and openness. And, and, it's, and, and to your beautiful point about belonging, one isn't trying to create an organization for people to become members and develop a group identity it's a a fellowship of love and inspiration and shared inspiration i, I would say in my particular case um, what i feel called to is to speak of and impart and transmit and and initiate around the universal principles that are true and essential to any path of consciousness development so I'm never ever asking anybody to throw away or leave their allegiance to any teaching or tradition that they're interested in or that that they have been inspired by. My my call, what I am called to is to show those who are willing and ready how to orient themselves to a process of 
complete development and to make the most of all the teachings they already are familiar with and to to make this path as joyful as fascinating as direct and as inspirational as it can possibly be and as integrated meaning to to do it here in the middle of the craziness right here in the world and to to be awake here you know like i sometimes say the light is needed here not in the realms of light where it already is it's needed here so i'm all about that and i've had the grace to to be in a multi-lifetime process of initiation myself with the you know adepts of south india and to be shown some of the more subtle dynamics of how to unwind the the deepest kind of conditioning that are the hardest to deal with i'm i'm very inspired for that and to support those who want to be sources of inspiration in the world to do so and to be brothers and sisters together and to to do great things together without having to belong to some field that requires uh, a kind of allegiance to anything other than truth. I love that. There have been so many people that I've admired on the teaching side who have, where the community part ceased being joyful. Um, okay, okay, okay. I adore you. I adore you from the from the moment I met you. I just, what? let me give you a very precise reflection. Wait. Dear Patrick, <laughs> I find the presence of unconditional love as transmitted through your voice, your exquisite articulation, the depth of your inquiry, the subtlety of the way you consider a question, all deeply inspiring. I find the way you can look so accurately at people and see the sort of warping or the struggle and yet it be completely held in unconditional love to be a inspiration and a deep support in my life and I love you. Thank you. It's very mutual, dear Christine and uh, and I I greatly admire the the life field that you have traversed and the vastness of your curiosity and and depth and just the profundity of your heart field and the questions that come from it. So I'm I'm honored to be here with you really and touched by you and moved by your questions and, and where you're asking them and, and sharing them from. And I'm up for sharing any time uh, that, uh, that the great field moves us to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's one thing I'd like to end with, and it's about being the blessing field and what happens when one person does their work. There's a lot of times, I think, a sort of an endless working on the self, spirituality is selfish thing, a meme that runs in culture. But I, I feel that it can be held very differently. And it's something about being the blessing field. So maybe we could end on just the invitation and the why behind it. Why be the light at this time? Yeah, that's, a, that's so such an interesting thing you're pointing to. Do you see... Um, one one way to address that that is maybe a surprising way to address it is if being the light means going upwards in an ascending process um, it's not obvious that it would be so important to give one's attention to that because you know there's work to do in this world and stuff happening and people suffering and uh, and crises and problems to solve and uh, and war going on and things to fight for se seemingly a kind of spiritual warrior doom if that's a word, that is associated with going upwards only, doesn't seem to be something that one could legitimately say is plugged in enough to the reality, in air quotes, of this world to be to be felt to be the blessing that, that we're kind of pointing to. Whereas when what we mean by embodying the light includes this descending process of meeting the conditioning, and meeting the places within us, in our human being, in our human consciousness that relationally generate separation and division and fear and are not merely finding us a safe place or a transcendent place of refuge within us in the light, but bringing the light down to, to hold the light here and ultimately bringing the light into our body. Literally, the body, the body itself is... An instrument of light. The body itself can be transformed in light and know itself in light. And as we heal 
the humanness on the on the physical plane and on the emotional plane and kind of downwards from the light then we begin to be able to walk in the world and become what i call like an unflickering candle in the hurricane wind of this world you know where where we can become strong enough inside ourselves um wise enough strong enough adept enough free enough um just inspired enough passionate enough to be able to 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 see through some of the the ways that we have been or have been called to be hooked into the memes of the collective culture and the fear field of that culture and as we unhook ourselves from all of that um, which is a meticulous process that no one does without guidance but as we do that we begin to be able to be here you know unhooked from that and to to live with a kind of joy that is a real invitation you know to it's the it's a real invitation to our brothers and sisters it's not to be the light in some religious or spiritual sense that is kind of abstract it's to be joyful here like really joyful here the kind of in the objectless joy and joyful and purposeful here the more deeply we heal ourselves the more joyful we will be able to be here and the more inspired and inspiration is a special thing you know there's no corner of human life however practical that does not become electrified by the addition of more inspiration <laughs> and more joy oh thank you magnolia champica is the most delicious smelling tree and so i'm going to leave you with the blessing <laughs> of jadamansi and the scent of magnolia wow. transmitting that to you from south india right to pacific palisades wow i'm receiving it i'm receiving it it's a it's the perfume of the great mother herself and uh, that's right i'm receiving it it's an initiation <laughs> it's true Okay, everyone out there listening, you can find more of Patrick and some recorded talks at patrickconnor.org. And if you have a chance to sit with him in person, it's pretty remarkable because a lot of the things we're talking about are transmitted in the frequency field of being actually present with Patrick. So if you get a chance, you know, come meet my friend, come meet this remarkable man and see what it feels like to be in the presence of unconditional love in the blessing field oh. all right my love thank you so much thank you christine to be continued thank you so much for spending time with patrick and i today i hope that there was something in there that moved you whether it was his voice and the way he is or his essence or something in what he said and i invite you to participate in this inquiry personally you know how do you become the blessing field and how do we all walk in the world as that blessing field? If you'd like to touch in with me on the podcast or on any of my writing, you can find me at christinemariemason.com. You can find my company, Rosebud Woman, at rosewoman.com, making amazing, beautiful, self-reverential, body-celebratory products and lifestyle offerings to really bring beauty into the daily experience of being alive, rosewoman.com, and on Instagram, at rosebudwoman. If you enjoyed this episode, my friends, please share it. Also, Spotify has a new feature, relatively new feature, where you can comment on episodes and ask questions. So if you have any questions, then I would invite the interaction either on at the dot rose that woman on Instagram, which you can find in the show notes or um, in Spotify as well. Okay, all love, all the time, be the light. Mm -hmm.